Please remember to like, subscribe, and rate on your favorite podcast platform. Trigger warning. This podcast contains discussion of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, and includes explicit language. Listener and viewer discretion is advised. Trauma is too much too fast. Something that hit, it's just too fast. An explosion, a car accident, uh, somebody breaking into a house. Being physically or sexually abused as a child, you're just kind of going about your business and then suddenly it hits, boom, like that in your body. Then you try and make sense of it. But the initial hit is in the body. It registers in there as danger. It even registers as I, I'm going to die. That's where you have to go to heal it. So you come into therapy, you can identify what the issue is, the therapist can, but they have to be able to heal it here through. Without healing, traumatic experiences can have an enormous impact on defining who we are and who we will become. Wade Robson and myself, James Safechuck, are both survivors of childhood abuse. In this podcast, we're talking with survivors, trauma specialists, and advocates. Highlighting the many resources available in order to inspire the brave steps to starting or continuing the healing journey. This is From Trauma to Triumph. Hey, everyone. Welcome to our podcast, From Trauma to Triumph, hosted by myself, James Safechuck, and Wade Robson. In this episode, we have an amazing guest, Dr. Larry Shaw. Uh, Dr. Shaw has been a licensed psychotherapist for over 40 years. He's lectured and taught at many universities in the United States and trained therapists all over the world. He was the director of the Hollywood Counseling Center, where he taught the newest cutting-edge therapies. He's also volunteered worldwide to help survivors deal with the traumatic after effects of war and natural disasters. Throughout his career, Dr. Shaw has found that body-based therapies, such as EMDR and somatic experiencing, used in conjunction with imagery and waking dream work, can accelerate the healing process of long-buried traumas experienced in childhood or later as adults. We hope you guys enjoy this conversation. Dr. Larry Shaw. Thank you so much for being here. It's so good to have you. Thank you. And your beautiful scenery behind you. <laughs> I know a lot of people who come on think it's like a digital background I've, I've placed behind me. <laughs> <laughs> so first, you know, kind of in, in full disclosure for our audience, you know, Dr. Larry and I have worked together for years as therapist and client. And, and Larry was um, the first person and first therapist that I disclosed uh, the abuse that I experienced as a child to. Larry was the first person I, I worked with to begin working through all of that trauma. And, um, you know, Larry played uh, a huge, continues to play a huge role in my healing journey. So it's an honor for me to have you here. It's an honor to be here. And just a side note, that all took place in this room. Oh, wow. Um, uh, when I when I see that room, it's like whoo, it transports uh, me right back to all of those experiences. Yeah. 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 So Larry, you know, for our audience, maybe we could just begin with if you want to just give us a bit of a sense of your professional background. I mean, kind of how you came to this work and a bit of what the journey has been. Well, it's probably too long for the podcast, but I came to the work of being a psychotherapist. Um, in 1978, having come out of a, a couple session with my wife, and I worked in public relations at the time, and all of a sudden sitting there in a very crowded restaurant, and all this, I had this realization, I was going to become a psychologist. And so I said that really loud, mm. <laughs> kind of screamed it and jumped out, I know what I'm going to be. Mm. or what I'm going to do. So that was the, uh, and the whole room turned around and thought I was crazy. Um, about how old were you at the time? 
34, 35. In your mid thirties, a big change in your, a big career change. Oh yes. Yes, absolutely. It's amazing. And, and I dove into it. Three days later, I enrolled at UCLA mm. to uh, start to get credits to be able to enter a master's program and then later a PhD program. Uh, but I dove into all the traditional therapies, Freud, Young, um, Adler, um, Virginia Satir at that time. A lot of what people were using is... Uh, as therapy back then. It was all talk therapy. There was no mm. body-oriented therapy. Mm. Also, there were no fMRIs to say that um, this is what's going on in the body or the mind as you are talking about certain things. They, they, they couldn't see parts of the brain light up at that time. Mm. So there was no research on it. It was just kind of whatever, whatever a therapist thought was really cool, they would do. And right. uh, sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't that. And then I was licensed from, uh, with a master's degree later on with a PhD. Before I was licensed, there was actually a time where I, I had to intern somewhere and I had choices. So I had a choice of working in a drug rehab place um, uh, or in a couple of places. And then also it was four places in a domestic violence. And I chose domestic violence, even though there was no violence in my family, but I chose that particular thing, specifically working with children. Mm. So unconsciously, I started working with childhood trauma because I would see that on a daily basis with these kids that came in. Either the mother had been severely abused or the children had been severely abused or both. Do you have any idea why you leaned towards that? It just connected with me, even though my mother was it's a whole other story, was um, an alcoholic and a drug user. And because of that, died in front of me when I was 12 by choking on a piece of meat. Mm -hmm. I didn't go into drug and alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. It was like I didn't even make the connection, uh, at, mm -hmm. even at that point as a as a fledgling therapist it was just like oh that happened that was terrible and yeah she was an alcoholic but i right. i dove into the more emotional part of trying to help these children that were coming out of war zones basically in their homes um it just feel, felt more important to do that and then very quickly after that i became the director of the hollywood counseling center in hollywood and Pretty soon I had 20 interns that were working for me and our uh, kind of the, the uh, mission statement was to help the youth of Hollywood. So again, it was youth oriented, child oriented. I, I'm trained in play therapy and this thing called sand tray therapy. So mm -hmm. all of these trainings, I, I, I showed the, uh, the interns how to do. And so our counseling center was mainly helping um, disadvantaged youth in the Hollywood community. In a sense, that's where I am. That's how I got to where I am today, which is helping adults who were traumatized as children. Hmm. So everything back from that first domestic violence place to the counseling center that I set the mission for helping youth in Hollywood, all of it was, it was kind of a path that I was consciously on, but not aware of uh, how deep it was inside of me also. Hmm. So then maybe early 2001, today is September 11th. Hmm. So 9-11, right. um, uh, so, but back then this is before 9-11, I went to a conference on this thing called EMDR uh, because one of my interns had told me about it and it seemed so strange and weird but as a licensed therapist, you're supposed to get um, these continuing education credits. So I try and pick things, different courses I would take that seem relevant or seemed really interesting or relevant to the work I was doing. So this one seemed really interesting and strange because it contradicted everything that, you know, all about talk therapy, because it wasn't about talk therapy, very simply, 
It was about talking about a, a trauma or something that somebody was stuck with or something that blocked their life. And then they focus on that very simply again. And then you watch your hand, the therapist, uh, the client watches the therapist hand go back and forth. And then after a while, therapist stops, asks them what's going on and they say, oh, I just realized this. You go, okay, pay attention to that. And back and forth, back. Very primitive, early stages of EMDR, but it worked. Mm -hmm. Um, so from there, that became the journey of where I am um, today. Five years after that, I became well, anyway, I became certified in that. Started helping the interns learn how to do that, how to do EMDR. Then somatic experience came in, and then the two of them tied together and worked really perfectly. With all of your experience so far, if you could speak to some of the ways that that trauma can impact a person. Trauma, it, uh, one of the um, kind of a layman's interesting definition is too much, too fast. Something that hit, it's just too fast. An explosion, a car accident, uh, uh, somebody breaking into a house, too much, too fast. And so that from your nervous system kind of from you kind of sitting there, whether it's in a car, driving down the street, um, in a building, before a bomb goes off, um, you're just kind of going about your business and then suddenly it hits, boom, like that in your body. Then you try and make sense of it. Mm -hmm. It's a microsecond, but the initial hit is in the body. It registers in there as danger. It even registers as I, I'm going to die. Hmm. A birth experience that is traumatic, that's the first thing that's registered for um, a, uh, a new, uh, as they're coming out of the womb. It's everything is, you know, we're walking back and forth and everything's okay. And, you know, mm -hmm. and then suddenly there's this intense physical feeling and you don't have any way of thinking about it it just registers inside your body mm -hmm. so that's even before day one actually because um embryos can hear can hear screaming and yelling and feel the um, reaction inside the mother mm -hmm. so from birth all the way to being physically or sexually abused as a child, too much, too fast, or mm. even neglect, which is the most powerful, I feel, the, the most powerful abuse. Mm. Because other things in very horrific ways have contact. There's a contact with a parental figure. Mm. But neglect, it's an empty hole, it's dark. It's, there's nothing there. There's no comfort. There's no solace. There's no holding. From the very earliest days to being bullied in school, uh, all of that registers. So that mm -hmm. sets a tone. It's kind of biologically correct to hold on to that trauma because it almost felt like life and death. You can't just cavalier, be cavalier and just say, oh, it's okay, it was in the past, because no, I almost died, or I saw people die, or I saw people around me die, or I was in a fire, or whatever. You can't just, you should not push that away. So biologically, it registers in the nervous system, registers in parts of the brain, that the feeling, the smell of fire will set off uh, the trauma of, oh my God, something's happening. Something's going to happen. And it, it can be very, um, a very subtle cue. You get in a car accident and the Rolling Stones, I'm dating myself, or maybe not, uh, the Rolling Stones. Uh, They're still relevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Rolling Stones is on the, uh, on the radio. You get broadsided, you fly out of the car, you land in um, chrysanthemums. I think those are flowers that really smell a lot. 
And so all three of those things are melded together. So as you go through life, there might be a time when you go to a party and you hear that same Stones song playing and you go, I don't know, this doesn't feel right. In my gut, uh, this doesn't feel right. It's registered in there, everything together. That was the formula that when you almost died. There could be somebody gives you a bouquet of chrysanthemums. I don't know if those are bouquets, but anyway, a bouquet of those flowers and you smell them and uh, uh, that doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. So um, everything is interlocked together. I feel like maybe for a certain amount of people, and definitely was even the case for me before I disclosed and began to understand what had happened to me and the impacts of it, that it would have been easier for me. And I feel like easier for some people who don't know to understand experiences that, that you described, like of life or death, right? A car crash, a bomb, things like that. Too much, too fast, happen out of nowhere. Understanding, okay, yeah, I understand that's traumatic and that could have a real impact on someone. And maybe more difficult for some people to understand, and definitely was for me before, to understand something like sexual abuse or that, you know, is a different kind of experience, isn't necessarily akin or naturally akin to a bomb going off out of nowhere, how that can have as damaging or, you know, as impactful of effects on someone. A child, let's just say in kindergarten, coming home and showing their parent, their, um, the drawing that they did, especially for them. Daddy, daddy, let me show you the drawing I did. And then the parent looking at it going, this is ugly. That's not too much too fast. That's just, a, uh, or maybe just an, uh. and then, and, or you drew a rainbow and there's no uh, black in a rainbow. Uh. So the kid goes back the next day and tries to redo it. Ah, uh, stupid, rips it up the next day. So uh, there's a the kid starts to, that child starts to have an interject of I'm no good. There's something wrong with me. There was no too much too fast with that. It was a steady drumbeat of you're no good. You don't, you're stupid. You can't draw. You're uncoordinated, whatever it is, you know, that kind of statement coming from the parental figure or figures who are supposed to protect, nurture, and support, and, and guide. And what you're getting is, oh, God, this is disgusting. This is terrible. You're horrible. So that becomes part of the, that child's script, internal script. It's called an interject because it comes from the parent into the child. And again, it's where, where does the child feel at first? <gasps> oh, you know. Not a thought like, wow, oh, my dad's, oh, my dad said that. Oh, hmm. well, I'm react to that. No, it's just like, ah, or tears. Tears start to well up. And in trauma work, they call it, say there's big T's and little T's. Big T's are the explosions, all that kind of stuff. Little T's are kind of like um, uh, death by a thousand paper cuts, you know, kind of thing. Right. It accumulates. Yeah. Maybe we just, as, as you said, you sort of started earlier in your career with kind of more traditional talk therapy approach. And at some point you, you became aware of these more body oriented approaches and then went down that rabbit hole. Um, yes. So post, you know, since the beginning of that rabbit hole and to kind of where you are now, I just maybe to start getting a sense of, of some of these maybe more body oriented techniques focused on healing trauma that you found most impactful for people? There's a lot out there. And since uh, 2000, I think somatic experiencing came on, on the radar <coughs> in yeah, um, late 90s, EMDR a little bit before that. Um, but the body has always been around. It's just... Peter Levine, by studying animals in the, in the wild, saw how they um, discharged trauma, which means if they've been attacked by a lion or chased, let's just use the lion, chased by a lion, how do they discharge those things? 
the body has always been there. We're mammals. It's always been part of the mammalian uh, process for survival. It's always been there. Just recently, again, aided by um, some good science, neuroscience and fMRIs, we were realizing how much the body holds trauma. So it really isn't which therapy really, but it, I always feel, I tell patients when I see them, this is a collaborative effort. It's you and I are working together and you have to tell me if it seems too much as we're diving into something or to, um, I'll check and watch you and see how this, your eyes, how your eyes are moving, how, and I'm not talking EMDR, I'm talking any therapy, of, of mm -hmm. how your eyes are processing it. There's a certain way the eyes process, how you might be all of a sudden, um, you know, picking at your, at your thumb. All of a sudden that starts to happen. And so that tells me something. Or as we talk about something, there's a shift that takes place and, or an exhale. So it's really, there's techniques, but how you use those techniques, how the, the patient is willing to try to allow those techniques to enter into their nervous system. Some guys, men especially, <laughs> Um, I'll ask them, so when, when you think of that, or when that, when you tell me that experience, when you were beaten as a child, how do you feel? How's that feel inside? And I go, feel? And I go, yeah, I mean, what's the feeling, the sensation inside? I don't feel anything. I, okay, so um, is it warm? Is it cool? Is it, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a weird disconnect between this happened to me. That's why I'm in therapy. But when I ask them about here, they, they don't want to go there. And that's too, uh, too fragile, too scary. Uh, not, not ready for that right now to talk about the feeling part. And is that part of a survival tactic that they... I, I find it more with men Mm -hmm. um but it, yes it is it can be or it is uh, men were more the hunter gatherers war guys so yeah more of i don't feel anything kind of thing where the women were nurturers i'm talking our ancient mm -hmm. neanderthal and and us cousins you know uh, uh so yes and that's still inside of us tens of thousands of years later that kind of programming is still there but I want to circle back. Yeah. So there, there's EMDR, there's somatic. Out of somatic, out of EMDR, excuse me, um, branched off a guy who's very talented uh, as a therapist, David Graham. And he in, created, re, uh, repackaged EMDR into a thing called brain spotting. It works for certain people. He is in New York. He works really well with creative people, um, everybody on Broadway. He's kind of got that niche. And then there's, there's standard EMDR, but that's evolved into you know, different types. And they keep redoing what's called the protocol. You ask this first, and then you ask this second, and then you ask this third, then you do EMDR. There's a lot of people that have struck out on their own because they've noticed something clinically when they're doing things, they go, no, 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 that protocol doesn't work with this over here. So they refine something. They try it 20 or 30 times with different people. It seems to work really well. And they start teaching that. So there's a, an interesting one, really interesting. It's called EMDR 2.0. And it comes out of the Netherlands. And it's remarkable. Um, going into the same part of the brain and jamming the brain so the processing, the loop that the brain has around a trauma. Uh, I, I can see my uh, father-in-law coming with the baseball bat to hit me again. I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. 
doing EMDR 2.0 will help jam it. And then they work for maybe two, three hours with somebody continually. This is a week long thing. It's a residential program. Mm. And then when they finish the, that, immediately they go outside and they work out on treadmills for or treadmills and weightlifting according to their ability for another 30 minutes or so. And then they come back in and they do EMDR 2.0 again. And they go mm. back out again. Then they break for 20 minutes for lunch. And then they do it again and again and back and forth and back and forth. And by the end of a week, severe, horrific, sadistic traumas and war memories and horrific scenes have disappeared or have been placed in a, in a place in that person's consciousness where they can go, that happened, that was the past, I'm moving forward. And so it made me think that trauma is, I, I would, is it a natural part of life? Like all, all animals experience trauma. And if that's the case, were, were there natural systems to release and heal from trauma? Like, is there a certain threshold that animals have, have the ability to, to let that trauma go? And then after a certain point, where's the dysfunction happen? And is is there something with us in modern life that makes not being able to deal with that we're not able to deal with trauma where, I, I mean, I don't know how far we can go back in history to actually have the data for this, but like, is there something about modern life about not being able to release this trauma? Is there too much trauma happening at once? And then I also thought about the polar bear being physical when he was shaking. So I'm like, is there, is there something about even physical activity that helps with releasing trauma. And then you just referenced this working out with the, with, with the EMDR 2.0. So I was wondering if those tied into uh, okay, that as well. This answers your question. This is his small book. Now he's got even a bigger one. His name is Robert Sapl uh, Saplosky. And hmm. yeah, you know, they got chased every single day by gang right. members called lions and tigers yeah. and and they have pieces of them bitten off or they have part of their herd uh, decimated and where there were 10 now they have three and yet they don't get ulcers right so they have a regulating system it's different we have a prefrontal cortex that analyzes everything zebras even chimpanzees, our closest relatives, don't have that. Mm -hmm. and all of their stuff is sensory oriented. So how do they heal? They have an, an, an innate way in which they tune into their fellow zebras and into their environment so that they can self-regulate. Some of the things in trauma therapy look really weird. The 2.0 looks more weird than anything. But let's just say going like this back and forth looks really weird. Or Prince Harry, interviewed by Oprah, and he went on a speaking tour about EMDR uh, about eight months ago. He was on like five or six different news shows. Um, and they even showed him in therapy doing something called, it's EMDR, doing the butterfly hug, which is this. The way the therapist used it seemed a little odd to me, um, but there it is. Here is the therapy that Prince Harry's in. So he's talking about his difficulty, you know, he lost his mother and all of that. And then she said, okay, I'll do this. And so, you know, what in the world is that? You know, that bypasses very, very simple that bypasses or short circuits the my mother died my mother died my mother died my mother died and all of a sudden there's this going on and it's like huh i don't know yeah yeah she died I, he didn't do this but yeah she died uh, uh okay yeah people i mean everybody on the planet's gonna die you know i mean that's kind of what comes out of emdr is a cognitive response to a physiological um, tightening, knotting, 
shaking piece. Zebras, and part of what zebras, all animals, you know, um, will, will do is that discharge thing, mm. that shaking piece. Unfortunately, a lot of self-appointed, self-certified therapists today have taken that piece and said, do you have trauma? Come to our shaking class. And mm. at that class, they'll get people into remembering their trauma and then, you know, start shaking. And that can be worse. But mm. You have to be able to process it afterwards. And it can't be the end of uh, the yoga, you know, a, a yoga class where somebody says some really wonderful things. It doesn't work that way. So you got mm. a lot of people reliving their trauma, shaking, kind of intensifying it more. And then, um, okay, well, uh, don't forget to come back next week and we'll shake some more. So mm. that's just not how it's done. You need to be able to integrate. There needs to be a cognitive result out of the sensory experience and it can't be oh i feel better it's got to be oh yeah this and that and i also remember this and i've never dealt with this over here is it like a mind body connection that is then real like you go okay there's that feeling but my but your mind is processing that feeling it's understanding that feeling and it's processing it in the brain in a better way it's it's yeah it's Absolutely that, but no. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's not a mind body, it's a body uh -huh. mind. Mm -hmm. It's always, trauma always registers here. That's where you have to go to heal it. So you come into therapy, you can identify what the issue is, the therapist can, but they have to be able to um, heal it here through somatic EMDR, Hakomi, um, trim there's another one called trim uh so all of those you have to be able to uh, be able to heal here so that um and then there'll be like oh i realized this and this and this okay i'm not terrible just because i i put a black circle in a rainbow you know oh okay i just realized i went i just went back in time here and that doesn't always happen. But uh, one of the questions I always ask people, they say, well, when I think about today and the car accident and the feeling of out of control, I'll say, where do you feel that? And they'll, they'll say, um, I, I think what I'm thinking is I feel scared. And I say, well, you know, I want to know the sensation. So in your body, what do you feel? And where is it? So they might say, I feel it uh, in my, a lot of people say, I feel it in my throat. Um, I feel it in my hands. They're kind of knotted up like this, uh, gripping really hard. I said, okay, so pay attention, put your hand. I'm giving, your, I'm giving instructions here to <laughs> the people that are gonna go take this and go, I'm a therapist. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, it, it's, there's so many billion nuances. So put your yeah. hand on that, on your throat. Feel that. What does that feel like? It feels like my throat. Okay. Beside your throat, you said you feel it in your throat. What do you feel? Um, it, it's tightening. I, it's, it's, I can't, I'm having trouble talking even. So let that feeling pull you back five years, 20 years, 30 years, even more and see where it lands. Don't think it through, feel it through. Let that feeling pull you back. And then, for example, somebody will say, it was when I was in first grade, or no, kindergarten, and I didn't want to go to school. And my mom said to shut up. I, you should, do not say that you don't want to go. So I was so scared but I couldn't speak. I wasn't allowed to speak. And so that, that piece is now the, um, the core, the initial seed, if you will, of 
don't talk mm. or I will be upset or you will lose my love, you know, to the mob. When you, when you say feelings, as one of the questions I was going to have is, are we talking about emotional feelings or physical feelings? But it seems like in this example, you were able to bridge between an emotional tension in the throat to, I mean, a physical tension in the throat to an emotional, I'm scared. So is it, are you building that bridge between this physical sensation to an emotional, uh, Yes, but that's what EMDR in this protocol does. When you think about the time that um, you were mm -hmm. beaten up, um, what do you, um, what's, what's the emotional feeling? Um, well, the emotional feeling is uh, I'm scared. What's the physical sensation? Uh, I feel my heart beating really fast. What's the, what do you, the negative cognition that you have about yourself? I'm helpless. You need a certain vocabulary, right, to, to, to do this. And I, I would imagine a lot of people don't necessarily have those, that emotional vocabulary. Do you, how do, how do you teach somebody that in the first place? I can't find it right now, but it's a, under a pile of my papers. I have a sheet laminated that's got like 50 words on it. Mm, yeah. And I go them and I go, which one? Here. Right. And when working with really young kids, like uh, one child that had, um, uh, anaphylactic shock because of allergies, I bring out a little chart, which was. Yeah, excellent. I, I go, um, if they're really young, you know, the cognitive, you know, how do you, what words am I supposed to use? Now I'm being put on the spot by this teacher guy. So, um, so they, let's see, confused. Yeah, yeah. Uh, scared. So I'll put this down, I'll spread them out and they'll look through them and they go, this one. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they're, look, they're looking at this over here, you know. Mm. And, and also, right. I, I mean, if they're over six years of age, they can read the words. But it's, it, it, it's going to their level. It's more um, not asking them to come up with words that they're not quite sure what they mean. Uh, they've heard mean uh, words like um, triggered. Yeah. Right. Is it, I'm triggered, I think. I don't know. You know. It's taking all those, then you do EMDR. Um, oh, and you ask them, uh, uh, how disturbing is this on zero to 10? 10 being the worst. And so then they, it's called SUDS, it's objective units of disturbance. You ask them, how disturbing? So eight, nine, 10. A 15, they say, you know, sometimes. So uh, then you take that and you do EMDR and you say, so what are you seeing now? Well, I'm seeing my mother's face. Okay. All right. And what does the face look like? And, and when you see that face, what are you noticing inside? Uh, still very, uh, it's hot or it's jumpy. Okay. Pay attention to that. The EMDR takes place. But all of this is not just, that's, the, that's how people go to one class of EMDR or one weekend of learning it. And then they get this printed out protocol and then they just follow it. And damage could be done on one side. I remember my therapist when I first, I saw him the very first, time I saw EMDR, I met him in the lobby. Uh, it was like, oh, I live in Topanga and he lives in Topanga. Um, I remember him saying later on when he would do trainings with EMDR therapists, he said, EMDR is very forgiving. Sometimes you just have to say what was the trauma and move your hands back and forth and the whole world opens up. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when I was going to my very first EMDR training, it was at the uh, near the LA airport in the Hilton, the big conference room. I was driving on this side street, um, and I got uh, rear-ended really strongly by a truck, and 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 but my car would still move. 
so I got the information and everything. And, and I didn't feel any whiplash then. Later on, I did. Um, but I had been hit. You know, exact. I had an EMDR experience one hour before going into this. So I had a <clears throat> another novice therapist and myself were in this training. Uh, we we pair, go into pairs. And I say novice because he's novice in EMDR. So was I. This is the first time we had experienced it. And we had this, you know, sheet of paper. And we go, okay, what is the trauma? How does that feel? You know, just very robotic. Okay, think of that and and hold on, follow my hand. And so no compassion, no connection, no nothing. It was just this mechanical thing of going back and forth and back and forth. And all of a sudden, what came up for me was an accident when I was seven years of, old, of age with my mother when she was drunk and she crashed the car into a tree. That's what came up. And I was going, oh. And I was discharging at that moment with somebody who didn't know what they were doing because there is this magic that happened in... Um, or, or there's not magic, but there's this process of just doing this back and forth thing shifts. Yeah, you're and, you're you're waving your hand back and forth. It reminds me of like the Jedi mind technique. But um, <laughs> what what is that for people who don't know? So you wave your hand back and forth, and what what what, what is that? It's the idea behind that. Yeah, this is um, bilateral movement which it originally and still, and there's lots of research on what happens and how does this work. MDR 2.0 says this is not how it works. It works in a different way of jamming the brain or it jams the brain so a new positive aspect can come in or a new transformational feeling can come in. But for most of EMDR's history, it's different definitions and you can find some really cool ones on the internet um, backed up with research. Um, it's between the left and right hemisphere of the brain. Uh, it is um, bilateral eye movement that is going between those two hemispheres. It is um, just it is distracting somebody from what they are thinking about, and all of a sudden, an opening takes place where something else comes in. Uh, all of that doesn't really explain how it works. It's not hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And hypnosis affects a different part of the brain than EMDR does. It's the bilateral movements between the, it's the movement between the left and right hemisphere of the brain. The left hemisphere is linear, sequential, logical. The right hemisphere is emotional, creative, romantic. Mm -hmm. So it's the integration of these two that help healing happen. If you only are staying over in the left hemisphere, everything is linear, sequential, and, and uh, matter of fact. If you're only staying in the right hemisphere, then everything, including trauma, is just like this flood of emotions. So you need the integration of the two together. So that's why when you're doing this, there's a, um, you hear a lot of times like, my father beat me because I was, because he was an alcoholic, but his father was an alcoholic and so was his. So it's like this history of everybody and this tradition going through. And it wasn't really about me. It was about this is what they did. And so I don't feel as bad about who I am. That'll come out of this. Mm -hmm. That originally came out of the idea of left, right, came out of um, <clears throat> Francine Shapiro having a some kind of relationship um, issue, argument or something. And she lived in San Francisco. Um, she was a cognitive behavior, behavioral therapist at the time, lived up in San Francisco and um, uh, went to walk in the Golden Gate Park. And when she went to walk at the Golden Gate Park, feeling all this angst and sadness and just sorrow, uh, she looked to the left and saw people sitting on the grass and then she would look to the right and then she would look to the left and then she would look to the right 
She went back and forth and back and forth. And by the time she had walked for about 10 minutes, she had reprocessed the whole thing and realized that um, here's what I need to do. This is, there's things I can control and things I can't control. And then she kind of went, whoa, how, where did that come from? I was in total um, sadness and terror a moment ago. And that just happened. She said, all I did was walk and look left and right. She went, oh, left and right. So then she started going in her work, having people look left and right and left and right as they talked about their trauma and what came up now. How do you feel about yourself before we do the exercise of left and right? Well, I feel that I'm uncoordinated, and stupid, and worthless and all this kind of stuff. So, okay, now follow my fingers and pay attention to that left and right and what do you think now well i don't know i'm well, i'm not stupid no no i'm not stupid but i am uncoordinated okay so pay attention to that and back and forth well I, my profession my profession is as an accountant i don't need to be coordinated okay keep going to that, to that. so that's how she did it but I look back on that experience of walking um, in the park, and I think it's the left, left, right walking. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. That was one of my thoughts was she just dismissed the whole walking part. <laughs> yes. And if you, <laughs> Captain Quig on Mutiny and the Bounty, what is he doing? He's walking back and forth. What is every guy doing? And well, back in the day when guys weren't allowed in delivery rooms, but what do they do? They're, they're pacing back and forth in, in, the, uh, in the waiting room, not in the delivery room. They're pacing back and forth and back and forth. They're trying to calm their nervous system. Right. The shaking is calming, is letting go of some of the discharge and stuff. The walking back and forth is processing and letting go at the same time. That's my thought on it. But nobody, I said, this is the first time heard live on podcast. <laughs> well, right, one. but like we, we get upset about something when we have an argument or we can't figure out what to do. We say, I'm going to go take a walk. Exactly, <laughs> right. exactly. So this is taking a walk in a therapist's office um, and, it's, and it's focused on, on where, where do you hold the, the trauma? How do you feel about yourself, your, um, your self-identity? What's the sensation with it? And what's the emotion with it? And a rating of it. And then you, you can't, you can, you could have them walk around inside the office. But this has been kind of the treatment of choice of EMDR. Right. Is there going to be a new technique where you walk in the woods with the therapist and the patient and you have your therapy while you're walking? I've already, you know, I've forever, not forever, but for a long time, I'll say, Okay, we, um, we're about to end, but I want you to go for a walk right now. Pay attention to the feelings and write down afterwards the things that you um, noticed when you went on the walk, what you thought about. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. The left, right, the left, right piece also makes me think of in my meditation practice, in Vedic meditation, and in many, you know, yogic traditions, there's this, you know, pranayam, where you kind of left nostril... Yeah right nostril right i mean yes. seems like there's all these connections there that obviously go way back so there's this thing that i have uh clients hold on to these two different things in different hands right now they're tied up and they feel these and this is the processing left right i mean it's going left right here but what that means is these buzzers are are making a noise or a sound and they're feeling it in their hands did we do this way when you were yeah it vibrates back and forth right yeah back and forth yeah, yeah exactly yeah so now because of um uh the, uh the coronavirus i had people get these and have it while i'm talking to them on the screen and i'm watching wow. them that's why I need a big, I want them, on, I have a big screen here, but I want to be able to see more of them. So 
I watch certain things and I watch their eyes or I watch when they look away and I watch all sorts of stuff. I say, okay, grab a hold of the buzzers, turn it on and okay, go. And then, I mean, I don't say go like that, but uh, <laughs> and I go, okay. And when you're ready, taking your time, turn it off. Sometimes I'll see tears starting to happen. I'll say, would you like to turn it off at this point? So I'm watching, monitoring. Yeah. So that's, this has been very helpful. So much of what you've been talking about, Larry, in you know, my own experience with, with this work, like coming in to start my work with you. I mean, I can look back at this in hindsight now, you know, realizing how disconnected I was from you just my shuddered. body. Right. <laughs> you just, right, exactly. that's what I mean. <laughs> that right shoulder. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. I went, I went right back I, there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, how disconnected I was from my body um, and, and, and disconnected I was from my emotions that I would, you know, I would be feeling, I guess, what I would call depressed or deeply sad and had, could have had no idea why. I mean, I just that all of these connections were just disconnected. Um, and it was and, and the way I would try and work through everything was, you know, just purely analytical. Right. And I would just over analyze everything and there was you know, yeah. just never ending process and and it was so you know i'd had a little bit of experience before working with you with you know some, some more traditional talk therapy therapists um and you know that was easy for me to go in there and just kind of keep talking through it all right but but i but i wasn't feeling any better and then this process beginning with you was so different from that and you know trying to spend this time tuning in with the sensations that were happening in my body of for, of course at first i had no idea why and why that was going to matter right exactly um, and and you know you would you would always listen so intently to whatever it was that i wanted to say but then then it was like okay great i hear all of that <laughs> let's you know what's going on in the body um, and taking that journey and this EMDR somatic and, and, you know, other techniques combined things, sensations, understandings, memories, um, images would come up that I just couldn't imagine ever coming to in a linear conversation, right? Like there's right. no way that would have come up for me. That I ever would have remembered to made any sort of connection between this thing that I'm going through now, this feeling that I'm having now, and this thing that happened when I was seven, and this thing that happened when I was three, like, never would have been able to draw those, you know, connections in any way, shape, or form, and it just, yeah, just so powerful. This book has been, I think, out for about four years, and it's had 52 weeks on the top seller list. Uh, body keeps the score by Bessel Vanikoff. He speaks a lot about EMDR and about body oriented therapy. But the interesting thing, and, and yoga is in here also, um, uh, it's body keeps the score, brain, mind, and body in the healing of trauma. It's, it's good. I feel that the integration of the somatic and the EMDR together is what's important. Somebody has to be really committed as a therapist to go through both of those trainings, EMDR and somatic. There's also a shortened training called TRIM, and it's really good. Um, I'm talking about a therapist um, doing this because it's a body oriented, and a lot of EMDR therapists will take TRIM training and they'll have a good skill set to do to be, um, to use both orientations, the EMDR bilateral movement part and the pain attention, where do you feel it? Somatic, therefore also to a degree trim, really pays attention to uh, uh, the body part uh, and 
in the EMDR protocol, they say, where are you feeling it in your body? So instead of just that I feel it here, somebody trained in the somatic part or the trim part will also ask deeper questions and tune in more on the somatic part when they're, when they're with a client or a patient. Does that make sense? And does that mean like getting kind of a, a, a deeper understanding of the sensation, like the, the colors, the temperatures, the textures, the, all that sort of stuff? They'll ask those questions. And also they've been trained in tracking. Uh, the somatic people are uh, people that are body trained. I should include Hakomi in this. Um, people that are body trained are looking, scanning, watching. I mean, that's a, the thing with the thumb. That was a real client of mine that would, every time we would talk about, uh, or she, I noticed she would do that. And then I noticed that it was specifically, she would do it when something was highly charged, even though she had a smile on her face. And that's mm -hmm. called uh, incongruent affect. It means they smile all the time, but there's all sorts of stuff going on inside because she's you know, picking away at her thumb. So I'll say, what's what's going on with that? Mm. Well, what's what's happening there? What, what's going on inside you right now? Because I noticed that she goes, "Oh my God, I used to do that when I was a kid. I remember that." So I'm like, okay, go to that place. Let that take you back to that place. And then it's I'm on a stairway, listening to my parents scream down below, and I hear my dad beating my mom. And that's what I would do. I just hide in the corner of that stairway just picking at my thumb. So right. all of a sudden, all this stuff, you can't ask questions that will produce that image that's so buried so deep. I mean, you can ask, where is that? Let it lead you back. But tell me about stairways in your life or tell me about, your, even if they hadn't talked about their mom and dad uh, getting into these physical uh, intense fights, and on the questionnaire I give everybody to uh, describe your family home. Oh, it was very organized and structured. And uh, we always had dinner on time and it was all really, uh, it was really good. And we went on holidays a lot. Those were fun. So <laughs> nothing right. about this other stuff. Yeah. So it's in the process of EMDR, which supercharges everything. The process of somatic, which supercharges everything. One thing I want to say is that EMDR seems like it moves very fast, and sometimes it can move too fast in an unskilled with an unskilled therapist. Somatic uh, has a very interesting thing that we used to say when I was trained: when you're sitting across from somebody and you're doing somatic therapy, it's like watching paint dry. You just kind of so thinking about that, just go into that and feeling that and notice that. And so, you know, you're just sitting there watching. There's no words being said. You just they might close their eyes, they might put their hands somewhere and just so what came up? Just the zoo? The the zoo in Los Angeles, the zoo. Okay, so just just keep keep your hand where it is. That's something I, I do. I don't know other therapists that do that, but I say, keep your hand there. Or if it's really highly charged, I might say, use your hand like feathers. Don't touch it too strongly. They're like, they're feathers touching this. So that gives them some modicum, modicum of control. It's not like, oh, you know, it's just, okay. Just feathers, feathers, feathers. So just touching, what do you, what do you sense in there? So I, I I've, I'm not inventive, but I've found certain things that work really well and I continue to use them. Other therapists will find things that work really well and they will continue to use that. Um, it's the therapists that just are operating off of um, an instruction sheet and just asking questions and then moving on and doing this and, and that. I'm, would be concerned about in, in searching for a therapist. Right. So um, anybody who's looking for um, a therapist, they should 
um, look at the level of training that they've had. And when you talk to them on the phone, they should talk to you the first time without charging you or anything and talk to them and see if you connect. If you don't connect, if they look just like your father, then, and that triggers you, then, you know, even though some therapists will say that, that's good, uh, so you can work through all your father's stuff. But if it is a block to you, then you need to search somewhere else so you feel like, okay, this person's got the certifications, this person's trained, I like the way they're talking. I, I think this could be, I'm going to try this. Right. Also, you had asked um, if they can't afford or find a therapist, is there something they can do? Mm. And um, Trim, the person who invented Trim, her name's Elaine Karras Miller. She got a grant from the Department of Defense to work with uh, vets who were coming out of Afghanistan who had, you know, intense PTSD. And the Veterans Administration didn't really have a, this kind of program. You know, they did a lot of meds. They give a lot of meds to people that had PTSD. They had some talk therapy. But, every, you know, there was tons of PTSD and limited resources. So she got a grant and she um, created an app called iChill. Mm. The letter I and chill. Mm. And if you put that in, sometimes what will come up is I chill beer. It's an app <laughs> for that, how to chill beer. It's not but, that one. <laughs> not that one. <laughs> no. <laughs> but if you put in I chill, you'll see a little planet and people standing on it. I think that's how it still looks. And it's free. It's a free app that's related to the sort of the trim philosophy is, or process. Is, okay. This is the kinds of things that you can do. So you should look at the whole app, listen to everything. It's Elaine's voice. And then up here in the right corner and left corner is this one that is help now. If in the moment you are feeling trauma, you could, there's certain steps you can take to pull down the trauma. This is reactive when you're feeling and experiencing trauma, an argument, uh, a familiar experience, a car backfiring, boom, you push that. And that's because you know veterans, all of a sudden something triggers them. They can't go and read a whole bunch of stuff. It's gonna be really hard. Help now means that in that instant, it says drink a glass of water, look around the room and find six things that are green. Mm. Um, count backwards in, in uh, uh, from 20 to zero, every other number. So 20, 18, 16, 15, 14. So you cut, all, all of a sudden you're up here in the cognitive prefrontal cortex and not in the brainstem, the, the part that holds the emotion and the trauma or that activates that. So all of a sudden you're up here. I tell people when you're tra traumatized, Count, I ask them, do they speak a foreign language? Eh, kind of, Spanish, sort of. I said, okay, count backwards in Spanish. And they go, oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> count backwards in Spanish from 20 to zero. Every other number will be, every other one will be English, Spanish. So it's, you know, I don't speak very, I don't speak Spanish. So it's Vente, 19, the SAO show, 17, the SA6. So it's like, you can't think of anything except counting and trying to be accurate in a language that you're really not trained in. And so it, it forces, uh, it, it disconnects the trauma. Mm -hmm. That's part of that operating system of EMDR and also somatic. Mm -hmm. So it's a, that is probably the best tool is that i chill one when trauma has happened to somebody whatever whatever kind of trauma it may be um and it could be easy and i've been there like it could be easy to to to, to get kind of stuck in a place of feeling thinking that like my gosh this trauma happened to me which is so unfair so horrible and 
because of that, like I don't really ever have a chance of having a, a good life for lack of a better word or, or a fulfilled life. You know, I'm cursed by this mm-hmm. traumatic experience. Um, is, is there another way to think about trauma? When we do either somatic or EMDR, so what is the negative belief you hold about yourself now? For example, oh, I'm cursed. I'm cursed and I'm of no value whatsoever. Kind of the thing you mm-hmm. were saying. Um, and how accurate does that, this is another piece of it, how accurate um, one to seven does that seem? Seven being the most accurate. So now that's a seven, yeah. So then you uh, do pull all the different aspects of where do you feel it, emotion, all that. And then you do EMDR, for example, and you say, uh, on a scale, how does it feel now? Oh, it changed. What, what is it? Uh, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't, I can't feel it. So if you can't feel it, what is it? Uh, 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 don't know, one, zero. And so you go, okay, notice that you can't feel it and it's a one or a zero. And so you just do this. So it's kind of rapid fire kind of thing that changes the, the person's narrative about themselves. Mm-hmm. Somatic, it is looking to ultimately have a cognitive statement. So the emotion, the sensation, the visual part, all of that shifts. Those are all sensations or part of the body's senses into a, wow, that disappeared. Uh, so what, what do you feel about yourself now? Um, I'm okay, I'm okay. I've been through some heavy stuff, but I'm okay. I'm not no longer just a survivor, I'm a thrive. I can, I can thrive because of this, I can do something. Mm-hmm. Kind of your story, Wade. Larry, thank you so much for, for taking the time to be with us and, and for all the work you've done and, and, and you are doing. Thank both of you for doing this. It's good to see that two of you have been, just like I've been gone through all my healing around my mom, but stuff pops up and I go, oh, wow, there's a whole other piece of the onion here. So it's good to see both of you have been able to say, hey, there's, there's an onion. There's been an onion in our life and we've done a We've done some major peeling back here. Um, and it's good that there's the two of you can support each other. It's just you had such a specific um, trauma. And it's good to kind of be able to support each other along the way. It's kind of like going up a mountain um, mm, yeah. and you're slashed together. It's like, oh, wait, your foot is slipping. Mm. Careful, your right foot, and you go. Oh, oh, thank you. And then he gets up ahead of you, and and, and you go. Oh, your rope, your rope is frayed. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's good that you yeah. got each other. It's the uh, that, that support is so important. Thank you, okay. appreciate right. it. Both of you, take care. Bye bye. This is from trauma to triumph. <laughs>